Good day everyone. My name is Noel Brown and this is Preparing the Way of the Lord Ministries. I hope you're here today after viewing my previous video, Three Lessons for Seventh-day Adventists from the Coronavirus. In that video, I introduced the topics of country living, medical missionary work, and true education. Today, we will begin our series on country living. The presentation today is entitled, Country Living is Real. Before we continue, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for being able to have this presentation. Once again, just send your Holy Spirit, guide us, speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin, let's review those quotes from the previous presentation. In God's plan for Israel, every family had a home on the land with sufficient ground for tilling. Thus were provided both the means and the incentive for a useful, industrious, and self-supporting life. And no devising of men has ever improved upon that plan. To the world's departure from it is owing to a large degree the poverty and wretchedness that exist today. The physical surroundings in the cities are often a peril to health. The constant liability to contact with disease, the prevalence of foul air, impure water, impure food, the crowded, dark, unhealthful dwellings are some of the many evils to be met. It was not God's purpose that people should be crowded into cities huddled together in terraces and tenements. It is Satan's purpose to attract men and women to the cities and to gain his object he invents every kind of novelty and amusement, every kind of excitement, and the cities of the earth today are becoming as were the cities before the flood. The Lord desires his people to move into the country where they can settle on the land and raise their own fruit and vegetables, and where their children can be brought in direct contact with the works of God in nature. Take your families away from the cities is my message. Again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions, for in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. We should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again. Get out of the cities into rural districts where the houses are not crowded closely together and where you will be free from the interference of enemies. Those quotes are powerful and clear, saying we should not be living in the cities but in the rural country areas. For us in the Bahamas, we would call that living on the family islands. Now, this creates a problem. If this message to leave the cities is a part of our teachings as Seventh-day Adventists, you are likely to ask, why haven't I heard this taught at the local church, conference, union, division, right up to the general conference level? A natural conclusion would be that this is either a lie it's taken out of context, or it's some form of fanaticism. Therefore, a safe thing to do would be to leave this whole country living idea alone to guard yourself from any possible false teaching. So here's how we solve this problem. Our goal is to use official church documents to show beyond a shadow of doubt that country living, this message to move out of the cities is an official teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church fully endorsed by the General Conference. It's just not a popular teaching, and I say that only because the document says that. Now, the truth is the truth, whether it's popular or not. John 4 verse 23 says, The true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Therefore, I'm going to challenge you right now at the beginning, that when this presentation is finished, if it is true that country living is an official teaching of the church, then by God's grace, commit to thoroughly studying this topic and apply its teachings to your life. Will you accept this challenge? If so, let's begin. As I previously said, we're going to look at official church documents on the topic of country living. 
Our first source is the Seventh-day Adventist Encyclopedia. You might not know about this book, you may be more familiar with the SCA Commentary Reference Series. This is Volume 10 in the Commentary Series. This physical book was published by Review and Herald in 1966. The digital copy is from the second revised edition in 1995. Let's look at the preface section. It says, The Seventh-day Adventist Encyclopedia is a compendium of facts about Seventh-day Adventists, their work, beliefs, organization, methods, and philosophies. The work is intended to inform not only church members but non-SDAs as well who may be inquiring about the church's work and beliefs. So, the purpose of this book is to give us facts about the church's work and beliefs. This then would be a great place to look for information on country living. There is a section entitled Rural Living. It reads, Living in the country away from large centers of population is generally recognized as being advantageous for promoting physical, mental, and spiritual health and development. Because of this advantage, Seventh-day Adventists have endeavored, whenever possible, to establish their institutions outside metropolitan areas and have encouraged church members with families to find homes in the country. So the SDA encyclopedia starts off saying it's physically, mentally and spiritually better to live in the country and that the SDA church has encouraged members with families to find homes in the country. That's right to the point and clear. The article continues, the advantages of country living together with the disadvantages of city living are stressed repeatedly in the writings of Ellen White. The following quotation is typical of her views. The world over, cities are becoming hotbeds of vice. On every hand are the sights and sounds of evil. Everywhere are enticements to sensuality and dissipation. The tide of corruption and crime is continually swelling. Every day brings the record of violence, robberies, murders, suicides, and crimes unnameable. It was not God's purpose that people should be crowded into cities, huddled together in terraces and tenements. In the beginning, He placed our first parents amidst the beautiful sights and sounds He desires us to rejoice in today. The more nearly we come into harmony with God's original plan, the more favorable will be our position to secure health of body and mind and soul. It says, The advantages of country living and the disadvantages of city living are stressed repeatedly in the writings of Ellen White. Then it gave the same quote I had read earlier that it was not God's purpose that people should be crowded into cities. It continued to say that God had originally placed Adam and Eve amidst nature, and the more we come in harmony with God's original plan, the better it will be. Just from this introductory statement, I believe, we can all see where this is headed. So far, it appears that the SDA Church does teach that we should live in the country and not in the cities. Now, the article speaks on the historical background. As early as 1890, SDA leaders were pointing out the advantages of country living. In an article entitled Rural vs. City Life, appearing in the January 7th and 14th, 1890 issues of the Review and Herald, G.I. Butler, former president of the General Conference, pointed out the advantages of living close to nature and urged SDAs to live in the country. Here's an excerpt. The present tendency of population is toward the cities. City growth is proportionately more rapid than that in rural sections. We feel certain that the great mass of those who leave the country for the city expecting to increase their real happiness thereby make a grave mistake. If such could realize the reality fully beforehand, they would never make the change. Cities have ever been and will ever be Satan's peculiar seat, just in the degree of their size and population, luxury, wealth, and pride. 
We do not see how anyone with the right views can love city life. We turn from it gladly to contemplate the quiet charms of country life. In part two of the article, nature presents her greatest charms in the country. God's works in nature are higher in every sense than man's arts can rival. Here children can be reared for God healthfully with greatest freedom from evil influences of ungodly associates. In rural life, there is a communion with nature and through it with nature's God, attainable which may greatly benefit those who live in the country far more readily than those in the city. They come near to the source of all things. A few years later, W. W. Prescott, an SGA educator and administrator, in an article in the Review and Herald, March 16, 1905, entitled Country and City, warned SDAs to resist the trend of moving to the metropolitan areas and pointed out that because of the corrupting influences of the cities, we are removing our institutions from the cities to the country. Here's an excerpt. Those who have read the history of Rome know that in the last days of the Republic, the people deserted the country and flocked to the city, and that consequently, Rome was crowded with a rabble of poor citizens largely fed at public expense. This was one of the conditions which made for the downfall of the Republic and opened the way for an imperial tyranny supported by a military despotism. The same inclination to shun the country and to abandon the cultivation of the soil for the excitements of the city is exhibited in this Republic today. Some are able to perceive the meaning of this movement. The conservative church standard says, one of the most dangerous social tendencies of the age is the drift of population from the country to the towns. It is more than simply a dangerous social tendency. It is part of a well-planned campaign arranged by the enemy of God and man who is making ready for the final struggle. We see that as early as 1890 and 1905, articles were written by the church encouraging members to continue living in the country. Looking at U.S. history, we'll see why these articles were written. An article of the USAonline.com entitled Urbanization of America states, the early United States was predominantly rural. According to the 1790 census, 95% of the population lived in the countryside. The 5% of Americans living in urban areas, places with more than 2,500 persons, lived mostly in small villages. Only Philadelphia, New York, and Boston had more than 15,000 inhabitants. The South was almost completely rural. After 1830, the urban areas of the country grew more rapidly than the rural areas. By 1890, industrialization had produced substantial growth in cities, and 35% of Americans lived in urban areas, mostly in the northern half of the United States. The South remained rural, except for New Orleans and a few smaller cities. The number of Americans living in cities did not surpass the number in rural areas until 1920. By the 1990s, three out of four Americans lived in an urban setting, and since World War II, the southern half of the country has become increasingly urbanized, particularly in Texas, Arizona, and the states along the eastern seaboard. This shows that America and other countries was originally mostly rural country living. And as the trend shifted to living in the cities, the church spoke out. Back to the SDA article on rural living. It states, between the two world wars, the idea of rural living was not particularly stressed. But during and especially after World War II, a movement was set afoot to encourage SDAs to leave cities and find country homes. Here again, we see that SDAs were encouraged to leave the cities and find country homes. It continues, in 1942, F. M. Wilcox, 
longtime editor of the Review and Herald, wrote an editorial titled Leaving the Cities in the August 27th issue, in which he urged SDAs to leave the large cities and find homes in the country, but cautioned against rash, haphazard moves, particularly on the part of those who had no knowledge of farming. Should our readers with children living in large cities seek homes in the country? Many are considering this question today. Some undoubtedly should do this, others probably should not. It is with the hope that we can encourage one class to take this step and discourage the other class from doing so that we pen these words. The instruction for our people with children to leave the cities as far as they can consistently do so is very definite. In the General Conference Bulletin of April 6, 1903, we find this statement from the Messenger of the Lord. Educate our people to get out of the cities into the country, where they can obtain a small piece of land and make a home for themselves and their children. For these and other reasons which might be given, we would say to those with families of small children, leave the large cities and find homes in the country, provided it is wise and best for you to do so. He goes on to say, consider now the other angle of the question. Some parents living in large cities are needed in the city churches of which they are members. They fill important church offices and they are carrying heavy responsibilities. For them to forsake their posts of duty and go away would entail heavy loss to the work of God. We cannot believe they should do this. They can determine their duty only by prayer for divine guidance and in counsel with responsible brethren. By 1940, 56.5% of the U.S. population lived in cities. The author still presented country living with a slight different perspective. Those with children should leave the cities, but those who hold important offices in church should probably stay. We will look at this concept of whether members should stay in the cities for witnessing at a later date, but the focus of this presentation is did the church officially teach country living? And we see again the message was clearly given to leave the cities. The SDA Encyclopedia article continues. It appears that after the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed, the General Conference began to give serious consideration to setting up an organization for promoting rural living for SDAs. Let's take a look at why the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki would play a role in promoting country living. First, a quick summary. It's 1945, World War II, and the United States of America dropped atomic bombs on the cities of Hiroshima, Japan on August 6th and Nagasaki, Japan on August 9th, killing tens of thousands, leading to the total surrender of Japan. A CNN article stated that the population of Hiroshima in 1945 was between 300,000 to 420,000. Then President Harry S. Truman authorized the attack on Hiroshima. The time for decision has come. In Truman's own words, I did not like the weapon but I had no qualms if in the long run millions of lives could be saved. On July 25th, the order is issued. Use of the bomb approved. The US B-29 bomber aircraft, the Enola Gay, dropped the nuclear bomb codenamed Little Boy on August 6th, 1945. Gay arrives. 
at 8.11 a.m. On time, on target. After falling for 43 seconds, the time and barometric triggers started the firing mechanism. A uranium bullet fired down a barrel into a uranium target. Together, they started a nuclear chain reaction. Solid matter began to come apart, releasing untold quantities of energy. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many fold. For generations yet unborn, for centuries ahead, for all time to come, Hiroshima stands as mute witness to the tragedy of war in the age of the atom. At least 70,000 people were killed in the initial blast, while approximately 70,000 more died from radiation exposure. The five-year death total may have reached or even exceeded 200,000 as cancer and other long-term effects took hold. The U.S. dropped another bomb on Nagasaki, Japan on August 9, 1945, killing up to 80,000 people. Japan unconditionally agreed to accept the terms of surrender on August 14th. The question is asked, why did the U.S. choose Hiroshima? The NPR article states, the committee settled on two psychological objectives of the first atomic bombing. To scare the Japanese into unconditional surrender and to impress upon the world the power of the new weapon. So, they decided this bomb would not just kill, 
it would do something biblical. One bomb from one plane would wipe a city off the map. It would be horrible, but they wanted it to be horrible to end the war and try to stop the future use of nuclear bombs. GlobalZero.org states, the Manhattan Project's target committee had been discussing which Japanese cities would be the most effective targets for the atomic bomb. In May 1945, the committee issued their recommendations. Based on three qualifications, a large urban area of more than three miles in diameter, capable of being damaged effectively by the blast and likely to be unattacked by August 1946. The committee identified their top four potential targets for the bombings, Kokura, Yokohama, Hiroshima, and Kyoto. Nirgata, an increasingly important port city, was also offered as an option. Kokura was a city of great military importance because it had the largest factory in Western Japan for the production of aircraft, missiles, and other weapons. Yokohama was an urban area that had escaped attacks so far and hosted important industrial activities, including aircraft manufacturing, docks, and oil refineries. Hiroshima was also very important from a military perspective since it was home to the Second Army Headquarters, which were responsible for the defense of southern Japan. It was an important center of storage, communications, and assembly of soldiers. The city's landscape added to its appeal as a place to showcase the bomb's destructive power. The nearby hills could increase damage from the atomic blast, and the rivers running through it kept Hiroshima off the list of targets for firebombing. Kyoto was another ideal target. It had a population that amounted to one million people. It was a major industrial center and it was Japan's intellectual center and former capital. Ultimately, U.S. Secretary of War Henry Stimson persuaded Truman to take Kyoto out of consideration as it was Japan's cultural center and a cherished city. Nagasaki, another important port, was chosen as its replacement. The population at Nagasaki was estimated to be about 263,000. Targeting was finalized on July 25, 1945. Hiroshima, Kokura, Nirgata, Nagasaki. The attack order stipulated the U.S. Air Force would deliver the first bomb after around August 3, 1945 on one of the targets, as the weather permitted. Hiroshima's weather report for August 6 showed a clear day and plans moved forward. Kokura, the intended target for the second bombing, was spared only because the city was suddenly covered by a cloud on August 9th. Nagasaki was devastated instead. Hiroshima and Nagasaki, two bustling cities with populations in the hundreds of thousands destroyed in a moment. Over 100,000 people were killed instantly, and the citizens of these cities had no realization that they had been chosen for destruction. The bombing of cities during World War II would be a good reason to consider country living. However, there's a little more to consider. Before even the events of World War I, Ellen White had repeatedly warned the church to get out of the cities. She said, There are reasons why we should not build in the cities. On these cities, God's judgments are soon to fall. The time is near when the large cities will be visited by the judgments of God. In a little while, these cities will be terribly shaken no matter how large or how strong these buildings, no matter how many safeguards against fire may have been provided, let God touch these buildings and in a few minutes or a few hours, they are in ruins. The ungodly cities of our world are to be swept away by the besom of destruction. 
in the calamities that are now befalling immense buildings and large portions of cities, God is showing us what will come upon the whole earth. Oh, that God's people had a sense of the impending destruction of thousands of cities now almost given to idolatry. The Lord calls for his people to locate away from the cities, for in such an hour as ye think not, fire and brimstone will be rained from heaven upon these cities. The time is near when large cities will be swept away and all should be warned of these coming judgments. Ellen White had given repeated messages of destruction coming to the cities and they were then seeing a clear fulfillment. As a result, as the article says, the General Conference began to give serious consideration to setting up an organization for promoting rural living for SDAs. In December 1945, E. A. Sutherland, president of the Rural Education Association of Madison, Tennessee, was invited to become the secretary of a commission to be set up under the name of North American Commission for Self-Supporting Missionary Work, of which L. K. Dixon, president of the North American Division, was to be chairman. The commission was to begin functioning July 1, 1946. Among other objectives, this commission was to stand as a body of counselors to such individuals as would decide to locate their families in more rural communities and enter into some form of self-supporting missionary endeavor. So a commission was made to stand as a body of counselors for those who decided to locate their families to more rural communities. It continues, Probably early in 1946, a committee on country living was set up as indicated in Section 4 of the General Conference Action for March 14, 1946. In August of the same year, the General Conference recommended the merger of the North American Commission for Self-Supporting Missionary Work and the Committee on Country Living that had previously been set up to promote rural living. The new organization was named the Seventh-day Adventist Commission on Rural Living and had Sutherland as secretary and C.B. Haynes as assistant secretary. Among other objectives, this commission was to encourage our church members in cities to study the instruction from Ellen G. White about country living and to develop plans whereby they can fulfill this instruction. To provide counsel and information to those who are considering moving to the country to hold regional institutes for self-supporting missionary workers and individuals interested in country living. Summarizing, in 1946, the General Conference recommended the formation of the Seventh-day Adventist Commission on Rural Living, which would have three main objectives. One, to encourage church members living in the cities to study the instruction on country living and also plan towards carrying out the instruction Two, to provide counsel to those considering moving to the country. Three, to hold regional training institutes for self-supporting work and country living. Note, up to this point, the General Conference had only written articles promoting, endorsing country living. Here, they created an official department of the GC to teach country living. So we can say unanimously that starting in 1946, the Seventh-day Adventist Church officially taught country living, the message to leave the cities. Let's continue reading to see how this develops. In harmony with this section, the booklets Country Living and From City to Country Living were recommended to SDAs for reading. An article written in the Lake Union Herald on April 11, 1950 by Carlisle B. Haynes provides a great insight into the publishing history of these two books. For the past five years, there has been sounding out with renewed emphasis the call of God for his people to leave the cities and locate their homes in rural areas. This call has been given impressive force by the publication entitled Country Living. This is a compilation of the messages given by Ellen G. White from 1902 to 1906, 
containing counsel from heaven to stand apart from membership in labor unions and get away from the corruptions and dangers of the cities. To many Adventists, these statements were new. To others who had known of them, their republication in 1946 was clothed with a new significance. A deep impression was at once created throughout the churches that this renewed call was timely and demanded study and action. A remarkable interest was taken in this call to leave the cities. Indeed, for a time, some uneasiness was felt lest there should develop a mass movement and families might act on impulse without adequate and intelligent planning and business-like arrangement, and thus bring disaster and disappointment to themselves and to the cause. This, we are glad to say, has not occurred and ought not to occur. If the instruction regarding procedure accompanying the heavenly message is heeded, it will not occur. The profound interest taken by Adventists generally may be discerned when the circulation of country living is considered. It was thought by publishers that a printing of 5,000 copies would be ample to supply the unknown demand. Just before printing, this was increased to 10,000 copies, and that was the number of the first printing. This was completely exhausted within a few weeks and a second printing of 10,000 copies became necessary. This was followed quickly by a third 10,000, then by a fourth and a fifth. At the present writing, between 50 and 60,000 copies of country living has been eagerly taken by the believers. The effect has been gratifying and impressive. There has been serious study followed by positive action. As families have found the way to do so, there has been a growing movement out of the cities to country locations. There have been careful plans, satisfactory and prudent arrangements, thorough inspection of new locations, close consultation with church and conference officers and wisely executed management in the moves that have been made. Only in a very small number of instances has a hasty or indiscreet move resulted in consequences that have been regretted. This is the way the whole enterprise should continue to develop. And it is to help in this and to answer as helpfully as possible the many questions to which any such movement gives rise that now a companion pamphlet to country living is published. It is called From City to Country Living. It is the purpose of the new pamphlet to present such general guiding principles as will be of service to Seventh-day Adventists in considering the steps which will eventually lead them to a home location more in harmony with God's ideal. The pages of this companion pamphlet have been prepared for the purpose of answering questions that have arisen, helping families to make their important decisions with wisdom and discretion, safeguarding them from costly mistakes and cautioning them against exploitation. The new pamphlet is priced at 25 cents and should be ordered from your book and Bible house. It contains the following chapters. The Call to Leave the Cities what is country? Reasons for moving to the country. God's promise to help families to secure homes in the country. Choosing a location for a home in the country. Gardening and other activities. Life at its best. The lure of the land. Enterprises operated for the Lord versus worldly enterprises. Learn to be self-sustaining. So we see that 50 to 60,000 copies of the book Country Living were received by the church by 1950. This is an impressive number, but to put this in true perspective, the membership of the SDA church in 1950 was 756,812. 50,000 books received means that 6% of the church or one out of every 15 Seventh-day Adventists had the book Country Living in their possession. So the message of Country Living would have been well known within the Adventist Church. Let's take a look at the book Country Living. First, let me say you can get a free copy of this book from many online sources. 
It's in the book section of the EGW Writings app, which can be downloaded for free for iPhones or Androids. It is available in audio at ellenwhiteaudio.org. Also, there you can download the text in PDF, EPUB, or Kindle. So if you don't have a copy already, feel free to pause this presentation and download your copy. Country Living is a small book with only 32 pages. You can read this in one day. Chapter 1 is entitled, A Call to Leave the Cities. Some of the subsections are, The Perils of the Cities, City Living, Not God's Plan, Cities to be Visited by God's Judgments, Eminence of God's Judgments, Peril to Those Who Remain Unnecessarily. Here are some highlights. In choosing their surroundings, few make their spiritual prosperity the first consideration. The world over, cities are becoming hotbeds of vice. On every hand are the sights and sounds of evil. Life in the cities is false and artificial. The physical surroundings in the cities are often a peril to health, the constant liability to contact with disease, the prevalence of foul air, impure water, impure food, the crowded, dark, and healthful dwellings are some of the many evils to be met. It was not God's purpose that people should be crowded into cities, huddled together in terraces and tenements. Notice the same quotes that were given before are in this book. And this book is compiled by the General Conference. Remember at the start I said a natural conclusion would be that this is either a lie, it's taken out of context, or it's some form of fanaticism. Therefore, a safe thing to do would be to leave this whole country living idea alone to guard yourself from any possible false teaching. Now, seeing this, you can feel safe knowing this is not out of context or fanaticism. It is an official teaching. Continuing with highlights, it says, I was pleading with some families to avail themselves of God's appointed means and get away from the cities to save their children. The same voice that warned Lot to leave Sodom bids us come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean. Those who obey this warning will find a refuge. The time is near when the large cities will be visited by the judgments of God. In harmony with the light given me, I am urging people to come out from the great centers of population. Our cities are increasing in wickedness and it is becoming more and more evident that those who remain in them unnecessarily do so at the peril of their soul's salvation. Just from these quick highlights of chapter 1, it's clear the message is, get out of the cities. Chapter 3 is entitled, An Appeal to Parents. There is a subtitle, Christian Qualities Better Gained in Retired Locations. It says, there is not one family in a hundred who will be improved physically, mentally, or spiritually by residing in the city. Faith, hope, love, happiness can far better be gained in retired places where there are fields and hills and trees. Take your children away from the sights and sounds of the city, away from the rattle and din of streetcars and teams, and their minds will become more healthy. It will be found easier to bring home to their hearts the truth of the Word of God. Send the children to schools located in the city where every phase of temptation is waiting to attract and demoralize them, and the work of character building is tenfold harder for both parents and children. The General Conference in this chapter is endorsing the message that country life is better suited for character development. Let's recap. Our goal was to use official church documents to show that country living is an endorsed teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So far, we have seen info from the Rural Living article in the SD Encyclopedia. It revealed that the Adventist Church began with members living in rural country locations. As people moved into the cities, the church spoke against this trend. After witnessing the destructive power of the atomic bomb, the Seventh-day Adventist Commission on Rural Living was formed. 
One of their goals was to encourage church members living in the cities to study the instruction on country living. As a result, two books were published, Country Living and From City to Country Living. These books presented spiritual and practical advice on leaving the cities. Having seen this, I believe we can agree that there are official church documents that advocate for living in the country and not in the city. You may feel surprised or confused to discover that this information was there and you never knew. I know I certainly was surprised. But praise God that we can even at this time still learn what is God's will for our lives. We'll pause here for today and continue in our next presentation. We'll see if there's more information to be found on this topic. But even right now, I appeal to you. You're starting to see the evidence. Please begin to read the book Country Living. If you were blessed, educated, informed, please share this presentation with your friends and family. Let's all learn together. God bless.